All right, folks, I am calling it. This is the last Rust news that I'm planning to do, at least for the foreseeable future, unless you convince me otherwise. I'll explain everything at the end, so if you want more videos like these, either hang on until the end or skip to the end to see how you can have an impact. And now, the news! Rust, got the logo up, 1.78.0 was released on May 2nd, 2024, thanks to the hard work of hundreds of contributors. But before we dive into that, let's catch up with some recent events that have happened since my last video. Number one, the RustConf 2024 lineup was announced today, and yes, I'm speaking. So come join me from September 10th through the 13th in Montreal, Canada. If you want to see me either spectacularly live code a playable game from scratch in front of a live audience, or spectacularly fail to live code a playable game in front of everybody. Either way, I promise it will be worth watching. Get your tickets at rustconf.com today, or at least before they sell out. Bonus points if your day job will pay for the trip. Number two, Rust 1.77.2. This second patch release to Rust 1.77 was released on April 9th, 2024, and fixes a potential security vulnerability in the standard library, where standard process command was not properly escaping arguments of batch files on Windows, which could lead to critical security vulnerabilities in any programs which passed in untrusted input from users. There is a link to a full security advisory blog post about this in the description below if you want more details. Number three, there have been some changes to Rust's WASI targets. This is due to WASI 0.2 being recently stabilized on January 25th. WASI 0.2 is also known as WASI Preview 2 or WASI P2 for short. There's a whole separate Bytecode Alliance blog post about WASI 0.2, which explains the new approach to APIs and component composability. Check out the link in the description below if you want to learn more. What is relevant to Rust is that version 1.78 is making some target changes. First, the existing tier 2 WASM32 WASI target is getting an alias WASM32 WASI P1, meaning Preview 1. And a new tier 3 target WASM32 WASI P2, or Preview 2, is being added. The original target will be removed in Rust 1.84, which will be released on January 5th, 2025, making way for it to eventually return as the 1.0 version of the target when it is old and stable. Number four. There's a blog post that is scheduled to be released tomorrow, May 17th, about how the unstable nightly version of Rust will now default to using the more up-to-date version of the LLD linker that Rust ships with instead of the system linker. This is expected to speed up linking time a ton, which leads to overall builds also being much faster. In the case of RipGrep, it sped up overall compilation by 40%. Your mileage may vary, of course. As far as I can tell, a date has not yet been set for when this will hit stable. Number five, the Rust project put out a blog post about the 2024 Google Summer of Code projects for Rust. Out of 65 total proposals, nine were accepted. Project one is adding lint level configuration to cargo semver checks. Project two is implementation of a faster register allocator for crane lift. Project three is improve Rust benchmark suite. Project four is move cargo shell completions to Rust. And the mentor here is my friend Ed Page. Reminder, if you want call outs in these videos, assuming I do any more videos, go to my website linked in the details below to get my contact info and send me your picture. Project five is rewriting esoteric error prone make file tests using robust Rust features. Project six is rewriting the rewrite trait, whose wording sounds recursive, but I'm pretty sure the project will be iterative. Project seven is Rust to .NET compiler, add support for compiling and running cargo tests. Project eight is sandboxed and deterministic proc macro using WASM. And last but not least, project nine is Tokyo async support in Miri. Now that we've caught up on recent events, let's go over the Rust 1.78 changes, specifically starting with the changes that were covered in the Rust blog. Number six, Rust now supports a diagnostic attribute namespace to influence compiler error messages. These are treated as hints which compiler implementations are not required to use. It is also not an error to provide a diagnostic that the compiler doesn't recognize. This flexibility allows source code to provide diagnostics even when they're not supported by all compilers, whether those are different versions of the same compiler or entirely different implementations of the compiler like Rust GCC. 
With this namespace comes the first supported attribute, diagnostic on unimplemented, which can be placed on a trait to customize the message when that trait is required but hasn't been implemented on a type. For example, here is one of the on unimplemented attributes customizing various aspects of the error that will occur when use my trait is called with a string which does not yet implement important trait. Number seven, the Rust standard library has a number of assertions for the preconditions of unsafe functions, but historically they've only been enabled in config debug assertions builds of the standard library to avoid affecting release performance. However, since the standard library is usually compiled and distributed in release mode, most Rust developers weren't ever executing these checks at all. Now the condition for these assertions is evaluated at code generation, so they will be checked depending on the user's own setting for debug assertions, enabled by default in debug and test builds. This change helps users catch undefined behavior in their code, though the details of how much is checked can vary. For example, slice from raw parts requires an aligned non-null pointer. This code with a purposely misaligned pointer has undefined behavior. And while that may not have obvious effects, the debug assertion can now catch it when it is passed to from raw parts because of the unsafe precondition. Number eight, some functions that change the alignment of pointers and slices had inconsistent behavior that made them difficult to use. Now pointer align offset only returns U size max when it isn't possible to change the alignment as specified, and slice align to and slice align to mute always return the largest possible aligned middle slice instead of just sometimes leaving it empty. Number nine, as I warned in a previous video, Rust 1.78 dropped support for Windows versions older than Windows 10 for the following tier one targets. There are lower tier targets that still support older versions of Windows if you need that sort of thing. That covers the changes highlighted in the blog, with the exception of the stabilized APIs. Let's go over some of the other Rust language changes that didn't hit the front page news. Number 10, using the config attribute to configure the target ABI is now stable. This has been in the works since 2020. This means you can now write code conditioned on the ABI for targets with multiple ABIs without having to use a build script. For example, this makes it easier to write code conditional on whether an iOS target is using the simulator ABI or the physical devices ABI. Number 11, you can now manually write out the signature of an async method definition using a future. This allows manually refining the method definition. Number 12, matching on the floating point value for not a number never made sense because the value is not supposed to be comparable with anything, even itself. So the worn by default lint has been changed to a compiler error. Number 13, for historical reasons, we allow static mutable references to arrays and slices, but not anything else. Using a static mutable reference is usually a terrible idea, but that functionality will not be removed if only for backwards compatibility. So now static mutable references to any arbitrary type is allowed for more consistency. Just please don't do it. Number 14, the deny by default compiler lint invalid reference casting already checks for when you cast an immutable reference to a type to a mutable reference to the same type. But now it also checks if you cast from a mutable pointer from one type to a mutable pointer to another type that has a bigger memory requirement. This is all only possible in unsafe code and this lint helps make this sort of casting a bit safer. Number 15, a new worn by default compiler lint has been added. Non-contiguous range endpoints detects likely off by one errors when using exclusive range patterns that don't cover all possible values. For example, even though this match statement is technically exhaustive because it has a wildcard branch arm, the fact that two exclusive ranges just happen to miss the number 100 is probably a bug. What a nice lint. Number 16. Using Wasm bind gen versions earlier than 0.2.88 will break in the future, since this is the first version to support the spec compliant C ABI. So a new worn by default compiler lint has been added to start alerting people to upgrade. Number 17, two lints that will become hard errors soon have been updated so that the lint warnings now show up for all your dependencies as well. Hopefully the annoyance will help everyone fix their code so it doesn't end up breaking when these become hard errors. 
Number 18. The lint introduced in Rust 1.74 that detects constants which don't implement partial equal but are used in patterns has been promoted to a hard compiler error. Number 19. The refining impl trait lint has been split into two lints to make it easier to ask for feedback from users in the lint message. That is not all the changes in Rust, but this video is not going to cover them all today. See my end message for more details. But I will throw in a bunch of cargo related changes that I had already prepped. Number 20. In order to stabilize the experimental automatic garbage collection feature for cargo caches, Cargo needs to know how recently you've been using cached stuff. So Cargo now tracks when you use cached items in an SQLite file in your cache so that when automatic garbage collection is enabled in a future version of Cargo, the data will already be there and ready to be used. The database file is intended to stay compatible across Cargo version updates. Number 21. Cargo uses a lock file and it stores data in that lock file. The v4 format of the lock file has been stabilized, though the default format remains v3 for now unless you explicitly set v4 in your config. A future version of Cargo will change the default to v4. Number 22. Cargo now auto-detects when the terminal supports non-ASCII Unicode characters. In the future, we may see fancier progress bars, fancier warning output, fancier feature lists, and fancier tables. There's just so much fancy stuff that might happen now. Thanks for looking out for those of us who appreciate the fancier side of terminal life, Ed. If you need to manually override the auto-detected setting, you can set the new term.unicode field in cargo.toml. Number 23, Cargo already supported a target.triple.rustdocflags setting for custom flags to pass to Rustdoc for specific targets. Apparently this support was quote unquote accidental and undocumented. Now it is officially supported and documented. Number 24, the cargo add command also sometimes creates a feature. Now a line is output whenever a feature is created so the user can be informed about it. Thanks, Ed. Number 25, when you're vendoring your dependencies and you try to run cargo add, you now get a better error message. Number 26, when you run the cargo doc command, cargo will now only list one file that it generated plus a count of how many other files were generated rather than flooding the terminal with a list of every documented file that was generated. If you want the full list, you can pass the dash dash verbose flag to restore the full output. Number 27, rather than spit out a bunch of progress output while creating something and then ending with a created status, Cargo now begins with a creating status and then spits out a bunch of progress output. Number 28, rather than all new cargo.toml files, including the long message about where the documentation is, this message is output to the terminal instead, so people don't have to always go and delete it to get a clean cargo.toml file. And that's as far as I'm going today. What didn't I cover? 38 more Rust items, 23 more cargo items, and 18 Clippy items. Why am I stopping? Well, I've been doing these videos for 15 months, and these videos take 20 hours or more for me to produce. Last year, that was fine. I was financially secure, I had the time, it didn't matter if it didn't make any money, I like doing it. This year, my life has turned upside down. I'm a single dad, and it's all different. I love making these videos. I think I do a good job with them too. I think a lot of you like them. But if I turn on all the annoying YouTube ads, I get 30 bucks per video. That is not worth it. I hate ads. I don't want you to have to battle through ads anyway. I thought maybe people would go buy my Rust courses after watching my news. Turns out people who watch my news either already bought my Rust courses or already know Rust. I've had a grand total of zero people buy my courses for mentioning them on these videos. Several nice people have given me tips over the last 15 months. You guys are awesome. It made me feel amazing that you would do that. I'm good at sharing Rust news and I wanna keep doing it. And to do that, I need to figure out how to make it worth my time. So let's try this. If 100 people will sponsor me on GitHub at any sponsorship amount, you can even specify a custom dollar amount. Or if I get over $1,000 per month in total sponsorships, which would only take a corporate sponsor or two, or if someone can explain to me in the comments how to actually make a living doing this and I think your idea is worth trying, then I'll make more news videos. Otherwise, 
I'm gonna focus on updating my Rust courses, writing new Rust courses, and prepping for my RustConf 2024 presentation. So what happens is up to you now. Sponsor me or don't. Either way, I have had an absolute blast making these news videos. Thank you everyone who watched my videos, made comments, gave me tips, sent me encouraging notes via social media or whatever. You're all awesome. Today's cover artwork is by Joel Marcy, the current director of technology for the Rust Foundation. Joel's Ferris has been drawn in the why use one line when you can use two for emphasis style so common among technology directors. The highlights on the eyes indicate that this Ferris is in a studio with a single light as he is modeling for the artists, suggesting either special attention paid to providing an austere setting or that Ferris was being sketched while being questioned in a police interrogation room. Indeed, the fact that Ferris's left claw is portrayed in a more open and dominant position than the right claw may suggest high levels of rustation stress. The absence of any lower boundary of Ferris's body suggests to the mind that rust extends to the lowest levels, even to bare hardware. And the subtle suggestions of cybernetic enhancements seen here evoke the progressive nature of Rust's approach to the mundane. If you want more videos like this, sponsor me on GitHub.